So good morning and welcome to Springton Lake Presbyterian Church. We invite you to prepare your heart for worship as we begin with this first song. Um, well, one is that it was celebrating when Jesus came into the city. What does Psalms, Palm Sunday mean to you? It means that Jesus came to Jerusalem to, for his cross ever. Corbin, do you know why Jesus is coming to Jerusalem? 
to be crucified. Mm -hmm. And what is he going to celebrate with his disciples? Passover. Two, it was showing Jesus how much the people, like, uh, I don't want to say liked him, but liked him <laughs> by putting down their coats and cutting down palm branches to praise and worship him. Jesus ridden on a donkey and the, um, the crowd shouted hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> Um, Hallelujah. at the top of their lungs and they placed their sweatshirts and palm leaves down. They did. For that's, him to ride it. That's right. And Shane, what's one thing you know about Palm Sunday? That they all wave their palms and honor Jesus. You said, I was going to ask you why did they wave their palms, but you just said it. To uh, honor, honor Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. And what were the people shouting? Hosanna, Hosanna, the highest. And what were they waving around? Leaves. And what were the people shouting? Hosanna. God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Bless the King of Israel. What did the crowd shout when they saw Jesus? Jesus. Hosanna. Hosanna. Why? Because um, Hosanna means save us. So and they want to be saved by Jesus. So they cried out Hosanna from the Romans. Ellie, what did Jesus ride on? A donkey. Seth, do you know what Jesus, what kind of animal Jesus rode when he came into Jerusalem? Don a donkey. A donkey. He rode on a donkey into the city, and the donkey was a very small, it was a young donkey. Why do you think Jesus rode on a donkey? Because um, it was actually a colt that was a new donkey, so he wanted to ride on a new donkey, so it was nice and clean, so I put it. Because he rode in on a baby donkey, and the baby donkey never carried anybody in before, so it was a miracle that he could carry a baby could carry a grown man. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Why do you think Jesus rode in on a donkey? To show that even kings or great people can humble themselves. I think. So Why do we celebrate Palm Sunday? Because that's when that um, week is when Jesus died for all sins. What does Palm Sunday mean to you? Well, I think it's, it's kind of like it means me a special day for Jesus that we put palms everywhere to celebrate the day that, that this happened. And anything else about Palm Sunday? What comes after Palm Sunday? Easter. Easter. What are we preparing for? We're preparing for Easter when Jesus came up from the dead and rose to heaven. Happy, Happy Easter! Easter. Well, we long for the day when they'll be crawling all over the stage, won't we? You know, uh, before I even say anything, when an answer to prayer walks in the room, you just have to acknowledge it. Olive, Nellie, and Andrew Paulson, their whole family back here, they were severely stricken with COVID-19. Welcome to everyone joining us today live and online. This is Palm Sunday. And thank you, Shelley, for coordinating and producing the video of the children. And many of them are here today. Today is when I imagine Jesus getting off the donkey and walking among the droves of lambs, perhaps stroking them with his hands and declaring, I have come to Jerusalem 
to die for my people as the Lamb of God. What a moment. Later in the service, Pastor Dave will preach on the arrival of the unexpected king from John chapter 12. But before we prepare our hearts for worship, let me highlight a few items from Friday's Springton Life email. Number one, I want to thank you. Thank all of our bakers who blessed the staff at Dunwoody Village with 100 gift bags on Wednesday. Let's give them a hand. In this simple way, we not only thank them for their dedicated service to the over 400 residents, and especially during the lockdown of pandemic. I mean, it's been an isolation uh, catastrophe for some of these people, waving to their grandchildren through a window, knocking on a window, weeping, longing. Hope is on the way. And so we also gave them uh, wonderfully baked goods, but also an invitation to join us on Easter live or online. Second of all, you can register for Holy Week services online, and we also have some pink invitations on the tables when you leave for neighbors, for friends, for family. You know, we didn't get to worship together last year, and Easter and Christmas Eve are the best attended services of the year. I believe our neighbors will be willing to log on and join us. And many will come here. And so Good Friday service is the night. Good Friday is the night when we remember the great gift of love Jesus demonstrated on the cross. And communion will also be served. Saturday morning is the Easter egg hunt. Candy is still needed. Grab a bag of plastic eggs in the foyer. And then return them full outside the entrance to Fellowship Hall. There's a tub there by Wednesday. And then, of course, Easter. Celebrate our hope and share that hope by inviting a friend. I told you last or a couple of weeks ago, 12 human beings walked on the moon. Today, only four of them are still alive. This is an event we planned for a year ago, but because of the pandemic, it's delayed. The youngest member to walk on the moon is Charlie Duke Jr., Apollo 16 lunar module pilot. Along with his wife, Dottie, Dottie is going to be speaking on Friday night right here to a live audience of women and then online. And then Charlie will speak to men and women. All are invited on Saturday morning right here. He has NASA footage of his journey, the great adventure. But the greatest adventure is when he, two and a half years later upon splashdown, came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And like his colleague Jim Irwin, who is now with Jesus in heaven, he said, you know, God walking on the earth is a lot more important than man walking on the moon. Prayer cards. We have on the table when you leave today, if you have requests, please let us know or go online. And also, I apologize, but it's not our fault or Scripture Union. The mail is just way behind, and so we have the April Encounter with God, and we have the April Discovery on the tables when you leave. If you're watching online and you use these devotions, we will put them in the plastic bins outside Fellowship Hall. Now let's transition to worship. For centuries, the church has memorialized today as Palm Sunday. Because of the palm branches and the cloaks, the sweatshirts, that were spread out before Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem. I think to myself, it must have been a mob scene with chants and joyous celebrations, but it was not to last. And yet, it is right to remember the events of that day with shouts of praise from our children. For even Jesus said to his critics, I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. And so they do. But in the end, on Friday, everyone hid in the shadows under the spell of malice and fear. But not Jesus. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. His determination, motivated by love, should amaze us. And for a brief moment, the worshipers got it right as they approached the holy city with their palm branches, singing the songs of Hallel, which in Hebrew means praise. And one of those songs was Psalm 118. 
If you're able, stand with me and we'll sing or say a portion of it together. Verses 18 to 25, reading responsibly. Imagine throng singing this hymn. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Save us, we pray, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Let's worship together. sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Consider this description of our Savior from Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself 
taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, yeah. so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That's good news. Let's sing the song together, Jesus the Messiah, the one who knew no sin, who became sin on our behalf, that we might become all the righteousness of God because of him.
take your seats. Thank you, worship team. They have been so faithful. I'm so grateful. Matthew tells us that after Jesus entered Jerusalem, he cleared out the rabble from the temple, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it into a den of robbers. Then he cleansed the people and the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. This cleansing and purging was foreseen in Isaiah 56 when 700 years before the prophet spoke of future events that revealed the heart of God for the world. Look at Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7 in your bulletin. And the foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Wide is the heart of God for the world, and wide open is the door to life eternal with the triune God of heaven. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for opening the door for our salvation by the death of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for opening the door of the tomb that sets us free. Thank you for the door for worship, for this is the day you have made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. Thank you for the door of our hearts. They are open by your counsel and by your divine will to understand and obey your word. For only your word gives assurance of your love, freedom from all fears. It is a light to guide us. Thank you for opening the door for the gift of the Holy Spirit who lives and abides within us, empowering us with gifts of the Spirit, enabling us to effectively serve you. And thank you for the opening, the door of prayer. Wide is the gate that leads to the throne of grace. And before that throne, we bring the lost who don't know Jesus Christ. Our family members, our friends, we love them so much, but they are wayward and lost. Our neighbors, our world. Father, invitations have been given out to 400 workers, or pardon me, 100 workers who minister to 400 residents. We pray, God, in that one little part of your vineyard that you would touch them to join us online next Sunday, or to come in person. We bring you the lonely who need encouragement and friendship. We bring you the hurting who need healing by the hands of the great physician. I think of Ruth Roberson and Nancy Snyder and Dave Service and Sue Bond. For all those suffering from COVID-19, for their complete recovery, we pray, and for protection from further symptoms and complications. We pray for the unemployed and the underemployed needing your provision and your care. We pray for the leaders of our nation and world that they might know you, the living God, and the wisdom of your counsel. For our needs are great. Indeed, they are overwhelming. And finally, open the door of our minds that we would be vigilant people, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus who said, Be on your guard, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will return. Surely I am coming soon, he said. 
Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And now as Pastor Dave comes to preach, open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word. Amen. John 12, verses 9 to 19. So you can turn there in your Bibles, if you have it. How many of you enjoy mysteries? You know, with a mystery, the, the classic plot is filled with twists and turns. You don't really know what's happening. It's not crystal clear until you get to the conclusion. And then all the pieces fit together, and you realize what's been going on all along. Our passage this morning is a little bit of a twist in the gospel narrative, and it gives us a little glimpse of the surprise ending. The picture is starting to come together. But Jesus is not what people expected. At the same time, our passage is about hope. We've got crowds gathering together. Sometimes crowds gather together for mere spectacle, but often crowds gather together because of some hope, a politician making a speech offering hope, gathering in the streets in hope of changing society. Our passage points to where we can find hope this morning. If you're here with us investigating the Christian faith, you're not really sure what you believe, either in the sanctuary or online, we're so glad that you joined us this morning and my prayer for you is that you would see that Jesus is a very different king and that he offers us hope, that he has faced opposition. His kingdom has faced opposition from the beginning, but it has been moving forward. Please join me in reading John 12, starting in verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb raised and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that the whole, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. So keep your Bibles open if you have it or turned on. Uh, we're going to be going, walking through this passage this is a scene of high drama in the Gospels, as I mentioned earlier. It's actually recounted in all four Gospels. And as we go through it, we're going to consider each of the players in turn, starting with the religious leaders, then looking at the crowd, and finally the king who's in the center of it all. So this is an event, as, as Rick and our kids reminded us, is called the Triumphal Entry. And John's account happens right on the heels of this intimate dinner party where Jesus was anointed by Mary with the costly perfume. And we looked at that a couple weeks ago, and Mark even tells us that it's on the heels of that that um, Judas decided he was going to betray Jesus. So in this passage, John is listing both of the the religious leaders. He talks about the chief priests early on, and then at the end he talks about the Pharisees. Now the chief priests were Sadducees, and they're getting ready to engage in an extreme cover-up. What's going on here? If, if you look back at John 11, 
Jesus has raised his good friend Lazarus from the dead. John tells us he was in the tomb for four days. This was not a resuscitation. He had done this incredible miracle of bringing somebody back to life. And because of that, many people believed in him. But John tells us that some people went back and told the religious leaders. And he says in verse 53, John eleven fifty three. 53, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Why would they do that? John explains their rationale in 11.48. He says, if we let it, they say, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So they're worried about a revolution that is going to bring down the wrath of Rome. Now you have to realize the Sadducees were the comfortable ruling class. They had it about as good as you could under foreign occupation. They ruled over everything. They lived in relative ease and comfort. An insurrection would make their lives a whole lot worse. Not to mention that Rome would hold them responsible because they're supposed to keep the people in line. So they are fearful of losing control of the people. So look what it says in verse 10 of our passage. Uh, Because of this, the chief priests now made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. They want to literally bury the evidence we got to kill this guy that's been raised to life. Now, this is incredibly important. These are the religious leaders. These are the people that are supposed to point to God, whose lives should be leading in reflecting his goodness, his holiness. And instead, they are on this murderous campaign to suppress the truth. Now, I just want to stop for a moment and consider the madness of their unbelief. You know, it's, it's easy for us to think that unbelief is kind of a neutral thing. You know, I just don't have enough evidence. I don't believe because you've not given me enough evidence. This passage is making clear that there is no evidence that will be enough to counter unbelief. There is a willfulness behind it, a willful blindness, we could say. In fact, If you're here investigating the Christian faith, you need to know something. Romans 1 says that all you have to do is look outside. All you have to do is see the flowers coming up in the spring, to see the beauty of the heavens, that God is screaming out, I am, from what he's made. But Romans goes on to say that we suppress that knowledge. We turn away from that. We choose blindness like these chief priests who were saying, let's let's kill this guy rather than change the way we think. Now, I just want to ask you, um, if you're here investigating the faith again, will you come to him in humility? Will you consider, is this true of me? Am I knowing and turning away? Will you ask him and talk to him about that? You know, there's another piece of this. I mentioned that the leaders were worried about losing control. One of the reasons we don't come to him is because of fear. We don't like losing control. We want to be in control of our lives. One of the reasons why we fear is we're asking, is he really safe? I'm thinking particularly of people who have suffered in profound ways. Is he safe? Can I trust him? And my prayer for you this morning is that you would see that he is, that he is safe, that he is good. Now, these were the good religious people. Let's bring this into 2021. Uh, Who are the good religious people in Newtown Square this morning? All of you people who have chosen to come to church today, right? Now... If we take this passage seriously, where are we in danger? This passage is saying that good religious people are capable of profound wickedness. That the most heinous sins imaginable, like murder, can be tucked in right beside your good intentions. We can be blind and not see it. Uh, And this should give all of us pause this morning. Think about... How many, sadly, Christian leaders in recent years we've seen exposed in all kinds of scandals? And this should really lead us to be asking God like David did in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the life everlasting. As we're going to see a little later, believing in Jesus is what frees you to pray this prayer because your sins are covered. You don't need to worry about being exposed. Now, the religious leaders are also unwittingly pointing to the future. So I mentioned they, they raised to, you know, uh, Lazarus was raised to life, and the leaders wanted to put him to death. You know, as they were fretting about this in chapter 11, the high priest says, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And then John goes on and explains, he did not say this of his own accord, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation And listen to this, not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Now, I just want us to think about this for a moment. Um, I told you in in verse 11, because of Lazarus, they wanted to kill Jesus. Now, in in chapter 12, they're going to add Lazarus to that as well. Now we've doubled it. We're going to kill two people to keep this down. You need to see something. That has been going on since the very inception of the church. The powers that be, those in authority, have been seeking to kill Jesus' followers to stop this thing. In fact, people who pay attention to this have determined that there were more martyrs in the 20th century than in the previous 19 combined. Thousands of Christians are being killed every year because of their faith. Now, we need to pray for the persecuted church. This is obviously grievous, um, but I want to consider for a moment what it means. The rulers of this world are desperate, but they are impotent at suppressing the kingdom of God. No matter how hard they try, they can't stop it. They are unable to crush it. Jesus promised that he was going to build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail, and he's doing it. He's proving 2,000 years later that his kingdom is unstoppable and it's indestructible, spreading to every tongue, tribe, and nation. And so that's the other way that the leaders are pointing forward to the future. Look at the last verse in 19. The Pharisees say, you're gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. That's what the high priest a moment ago we look at prophesied, that they are all scattered abroad, that that this is going to go out from the Jewish nation to all people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And so in John's gospel, you'll notice in the next uh, passage, the Greeks are coming to him. It's a foretaste, a foreshadowing of what is going to happen. Now, John describes two crowds in this passage. One that came to Bethany because they wanted to see Jesus, and they wanted to see Lazarus. And then also all these pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem for the feast. Now, the first crowd is the one that is already with them in Bethany. This is the one that the, the, is raising the concerns of the chief priests in uh, verses 10 and 11. Um, and we, we looked a couple weeks ago at the intimate dinner party, right? I described it as this quiet moment that Jesus had with his friends. Well, John tells us now that the people crashed that dinner party. They heard what was going on. They all came to see what was happening because they wanted to see Lazarus. Um, If you are in Christ, is your redeemed life drawing attention? You know, Jesus did not come to make good people. He came to raise the dead and to give life to us. Um, People notice radical transformation. They notice lives that are changed. So I want to ask you, is anyone noticing as they look at your life? You know, then John tells us that that the next day, the word had spread broadly in Jerusalem. So now crowds are are streaming out of the city to come and meet him on the road and then usher him into the city. I want you to keep that picture in your mind. We're going to come back to that at the end of the sermon. So the crowds have come seeking deliverance. So we heard it from the kids. We see it in our passage that they're shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. First, Hosanna, as, as one, of, one of the Torrance kids, I think, mentioned, means save now or save us. So we often sing Hosanna as kind of a word of praise. 
But in the Hebrew, and in the context, I would say, of both Psalm 118 and our passage in the triumphal entry, it is a desperate plea for deliverance. It is a people crying out, we are living under oppression and we want to be set free. They are seeking deliverance. In fact, this scene would have evoked something from Israel's not-so-distant future. In the second century B.C., Simon Maccabeus rode into Jerusalem after defeating the Syrians, and the crowds came out singing, historians tell us, Psalm 118, just like they do here for Jesus, waving palm branches. So, so this was a picture from their history of what a victorious military leader looked like. The hope of military victory over their oppressors. And so you see why the religious leaders are upset. This is not an innocuous situation. They actually had reason to worry. If Jesus so desired, he could have motivated this mob to go storm the Roman citadel. And all the evidence is that they would have done it. They would have followed him, but this was not his plan. So the crowd celebrates because they're expecting the deliverance of a military leader. But what we need to realize is that these were misguided expectations. On one level, they worshipped better than they knew. On another, they had a hope that he was not looking to realize. Um, and that's why a few days hence, this same crowd is going to be screaming for his death. Why? Because they didn't get him, give, he did not give them what they were hoping for. Now think about it this way, particularly in the context of the raising of Lazarus. What would be better than a military leader who could raise the dead? If that's not a threat, your enemies have no power over you. So I just want you to, to check out this, this little passage that really, I think, captures this. It's from Oscar Wilde's uh, play, Salome. And so Herod says... What is this miracle of the daughter of Jairus? The daughter of Jairus was dead. This man raised her from the dead. How? He raises people from the dead? Yea, sire, he, he raiseth the dead. I do not wish him to do that. I forbid him to do that. I suffer no man to raise the dead. This, must be, this man must be found and told that I forbid him to raise the dead. Where is this man at present? He is in every place, my lord but it is hard to find him. Now, it's a comic scene, but what's going on here? Herod realizes, you know, it's helpful, it's helpful to have a healer, someone who can heal the lame and get them back to work. But if someone raises the dead, then the tyrant's greatest weapon has been taken from him. He no longer has the power to wield and control the people. There is no stopping such a man. And John makes clear in our passage that this was the hope of the crowd. He's the only gospel that recounts the raising of Lazarus. And he's the only one who really tells us that the crowd was fueled by these witnesses that kept retelling the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Anyone who could perform this sign was unstoppable. And of course, this is true. I mentioned a little while ago that, that Jesus' kingdom is unstoppable, but he's not the leader they were looking for. Now, before we go on, you need to realize that there is a warning here for us from this fickle crowd. You know, today they are waving palm branches and crying out for deliverance in a mere five days. They will, screaming, they will be screaming for his death and saying, let his blood be on us and on our children. Why? because he failed to do what they wanted him to do. We need to be really careful about coming to Jesus with, with our demands, with our agenda of what we think he should do. Otherwise, we are in real danger of becoming disenchanted, angry, embittered when things don't go our way. You know, as we'll see in a moment, Jesus accepts their praise as king but he came as the king that his father had appointed, not the king that was going to follow the people's agenda for him. So I want to ask you, what are you expecting from Jesus? And when he doesn't deliver, how do you respond? Does it seem like he is over-promising and under-delivering for you? 
you know, I've only been with the church here for about a year and a half, but already I know, having come alongside many of you who have been praying for years and years and years, as Rick mentioned in his prayer, some of you for wayward children or for others you love who are on a destructive path. Some of you dealing with profound physical ailments, crying out for relief. Some of you having received, even just this week, horrible news about your health. How do we respond when Jesus doesn't seem to answer the prayers that can even have godly expectations to them? You know, the people were looking for deliverance from Rome. That was a good thing to desire. But he didn't respond in their timing or liking. These are hard things. Um, One of the reasons why I just want to encourage you to join us for the prayer meeting tonight is that we do need to come together to be praying. So that's on Zoom at 7 o'clock. The information was in the Friday email. We need to encourage and support each other in this. But how are you going to respond when Jesus does not do what you expect? I love John's honesty in verse 16. We didn't get what was going on, he tells us. This was one of Jesus' closest disciples. We didn't get it. We were so ignorant and obtuse, we didn't get it until our eyes were open, until we saw him glorified. And that brings us to the last character here, the king. What kind of king are we talking about? First of all, he is fulfilling prophecy. I want you to realize this. Jesus knows who he is. The synoptics go in much more detail describing how he instructed his disciples to go and and procure the donkey's colt for him. Um, John just cuts to the chase. They are hailing him as king, and he grabs a donkey in order to fulfill Zechariah's prophecy. We put the whole uh, prophecy of Zechariah on the back of your bulletin. But in verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You know, up to this point, Jesus has been avoiding the spotlight. He has shunned the people's desire to make him king on a number of occasions. In the gospel, they come to him seeking to make him king. But now his hour has come. He receives their praise and he rides boldly into Jerusalem. And I want you to consider this for a moment. The the, the courage that's involved here. Jesus was an outlaw. He knew the leaders had put a price on his head. They were trying to kill him. And John told us actually in in chapter 11 that for that reason he went out into the wilderness after the raising of Lazarus. But now he rides boldly into the royal city. He is defying the powers that be. And he's not sneaking in through some kind of back alley into Jerusalem. He is making an entry that assures every eye in that city will be focused on him. He defies the leaders, their power and their ability to bring destruction. Now, one of my favorite literary pictures of an unexpected king is Aragorn from The Lord of the Rings. Um, And this is one of the reasons, by the way, that you need to read the books. Uh, The director, Peter Jackson, has a lot to answer for here because he really has distorted uh, some of the characters, Aragorn in particular. He's not the, the, the weak, insecure character of the movie who's unsure of his ability and his destiny. In the book... He's a confident hero who knew his identity from the very beginning. The very first scene you see him, he has the broken sword. He declares who he is as the rightful heir to the throne. Uh, He's waiting for the day when that sword will be reforged. And then finally, after his first victory over his enemies, he's going to make his identity known to the powers that be. And so Tolkien writes, not all who wander are lost. So Jesus has been biding his time. But now, we've talked about in past weeks in our study of Mark how he was setting the stage for this. Now, his timing and arrival to Jerusalem, he planned for the Passover because as we were singing about earlier, he came to go to the cross. Now, why? Why does he do this? Jesus came bringing peace for us. He doesn't arrive, look at the scene again, as a conqueror on a stallion, but a messenger of peace riding on a donkey. Zechariah, as we read a moment ago, prophesied this, that the true king would be arriving without a bunch of pomp and circumstance. He comes into the city like a typical commoner, like a peasant on a trip to town. 
as the picture you see here depicts, this is a small, humble animal. The foal would have been that little guy where his feet, he would have had to lift his feet to keep them from dragging along. Um, he demonstrates not only that he fulfills his prophecy, that he's the true king, but also the kind of king he's going to be. He comes as the prince of peace, as Isaiah had said. You know, this is Jesus' response to Hosanna, save now. He's saying, don't worry, your king is coming to you, bringing you peace. But the crowds didn't get it. And we still struggle to understand and see the love and the sacrifice, the care that he has for us that is something unexpected. The sacrifice was unexpected. It's something we could have never imagined. So how is he bringing peace? Again, he's doing it in an unexpected way. The kingdom seems upside down to us. After defying the powers that be, he then is willing to be crushed by them. He was willing to become accursed for us. The Bible puts it like this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. He went under, under the curse in order to drain the curse of its power against us. It was emptied out on him, reaching its deepest depths in him so that we can be set free from it. That's why Isaiah 53 puts it like this. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with, with, with his wounds, we are healed. How did Jesus bring peace? By being pierced, crushed, crushed, chastised, wounded for us. That's why we're, we're going to gather on Friday to celebrate this and to partake of the Lord's Supper, remembering what he's done. He bought a costly peace with his own blood for us. And we see this written through the stories of our culture. Think about innocent Aslan submits to die a traitor's death on the stone table so that the deeper magic back from before the dawn of time will break into time and death will begin to work backwards. And then you go all the way down to, to Neo, who in their final showdown surrenders to Agent Smith, allowing this scourge to completely overrun the Matrix which leads to a massive system failure, and then the system reboots new creation. There is an emptying out of the curse. Jesus surrendered himself to the evil powers. He allowed the curse to have its head, so to speak, to get to its deepest depths. He came in love to do that for us. That was his plan from the beginning. I said a while ago that we often fear, can I trust this person? The cross is the example, the most profound example he could have ever done to say, you can trust me. I love you, and I am for you. But that's not the end of the story. I was saying that the triumphal entry gives a little foretaste of where all this is headed. It's a little hint at the conclusion. Jesus is arriving in glory to Jerusalem because it's looking forward to the finale. John recounts, as I read a moment ago, that his, di his disciples didn't understand these things. They needed all the pieces of the puzzle. When they saw Jesus resurrected, everything clicked. Luke 24 recounts it this way, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened his minds to understand the scriptures. Now, all of a sudden, they realize that all the promises that have been given to the people of God had been fulfilled in Jesus, who went to the cross for them, paid the price for their sin, and then was raised to life. Like a classic whodunit, everything came together. And so Zechariah's prophecy that's on the back of your bullet, and I won't go through that now, points to both this example from the Gospels, but also looks forward to when wars are ended at the end of time, like, like Mark 13, it is both the near and distant future that we spent a number of weeks looking at, um, looking forward to his final return. And so the writer of Hebrews says, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, 
because it's already been dealt with, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Are you eagerly waiting? If not, could it be because you don't have all the pieces yet? Is this what you're living for? Or are you holding out because there's still a part of you that mistrusts him? What is this second appearing? I told you at the outset of the sermon to hold on to that picture in your mind of the crowds going out from Jerusalem to meet him on the road and usher him into the city. Uh, This is the picture we get from 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. What what is this picture? It is heaven coming down to earth. Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 both describe that in Jesus, heaven and earth are united. And what his return means is that what happened with Jesus is going to happen with the entire cosmos. He is going to bring heaven and earth together. This picture from 1 Thessalonians 4 is not, we're all going to go fly off somewhere. It's we're going to go meet him in the air to usher him into his kingdom just like the crowd going out to meet him and bring him into Jerusalem. And so we will always be with the Lord, bringing him in to reign. As it says in in Zechariah, not over just one little country in Palestine, but to the ends of the earth. All the earth will declare his glory. Uh, It's kind of like what we see in Revelation 19. It's a similar scene except very different in some ways. In Revelation 19, it is a war horse because he's coming to crush all his enemies, not to be crushed by them. He comes to bring peace at last. And it's not an escape, but to deal with the problems and bring healing to this broken world. That is the ultimate glorious arrival to what this one is just a tiny foretaste that we see in the Gospels. If you understand this truth, it will change your life. If you understand his love for you, it will reorder the priorities and the things that are weighing you down. Do you know the depth of the love of this unexpected king for you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us in sending Jesus We pray that the hope that we see in this passage would fill our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our closing hymn, which is a modern day hymn uh, kind of explaining how God reconciles sinners to himself, the power of the cross.
did all this in love for you. Now receive your benediction, a word from the one who has promised to see it through to the end. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated and the ushers will dismiss you. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running.